and desolated Jerusalem, just as Jesus warned would happen if the divinely favored nation rejected its Messiah. Look at Jeremiah chapter 30. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. What does that mean? What does that mean? Jeremiah chapter 30. Beginning of verse number 3. We see a wonderful promise here. It says, For lo, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now here's one thing I thought about in thinking about this whole conflict. There's only one reason why anybody would feel like the Jewish people deserve to be in the land of Palestine. Only one reason. And that is because you believe the Bible. It's the only reason. We believe that there is a uh, eternally perpetual agreement that the children of Israel are to inhabit and to live in that land. But you think about things from the Arab perspective where they don't see things from the lens of the Bible. You look at things from the perspective of those who have cast off the scriptures as fairy tales and myths. They look at Israel and they see Great Britain coming in there in 1948 and just carving out a piece of land, kicking out the Arab inhabitants and saying to the Jewish people, okay, y'all move in. Is there any wonder that these who reject the Holy Scriptures are asking the question, why do the Jews deserve this land? Why don't the people who lived there before 1948 deserve this land? The only reason you can believe in the Jewish state of Israel that it has a right to exist is because the Scriptures are the ones that tell us that. And that it came from Almighty God. And so I agree that that is their land. Because I believe the Bible. And I believe that God still has a plan for Israel. So Jeremiah is saying here, you're going to be gathered back to the land. But read verses 4 and following. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. We touched on this in Revelation, studying Revelation in Sunday school. The time of Jacob's trouble is what we popularly call the tribulation. And only as Israel goes through suffering will Israel come to the knowledge of Jesus as their Messiah. That's what Jeremiah is saying. So praying for the peace of Jerusalem doesn't necessarily mean that conflict and suffering is going to end for the Jewish people. But instead, perhaps it means it's going to intensify so that they're brought to their knees and brought to their Savior. Do you understand that? That's true in our lives as well. You know, this can apply to individuals as well. You want to pray for someone? Perhaps the best thing that can happen to someone is for his or her life to fall completely apart. Because only when their lives fall completely apart will they be humble enough to come to the Savior and have true peace. You understand how that works? 
to pray for them in this situation they find themselves in. Okay? We'll pray for their peace. But we need to pray that the situations drive us to the Savior. And that's the same way it is with Israel. Verse 8. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Out of this suffering, the Jewish people are going to bow their knee, be restored to the land, serve their God, and it says David their king will be raised up to rule over them. There are some people who believe this is literally David. I don't. I believe this is the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Think about these words here. Babylon, wiped out. Persia, wiped out. Greece, wiped out. Rome, ah, it's laying dormant. <laughs> but it's wiped out from its glory. But Israel? No. I, 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 I chasten you. I discipline you by measure. I am correcting you. I'm driving you to myself. But no, I'm not going to wipe you out. I've still got plans for you, is what God is saying here. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. That's two books from the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 12, beginning of verse number 6. In that day, the day of the Lord, will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, like a torch of fire in a sheath, they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand, on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Do you get the point of that? He's saying here, one day, it's going to be as if Israel's enemies are a bunch of dry wood. And Israel has a flamethrower. And Israel's going to be victorious over all its enemies. That's what Zechariah is saying. But something has to happen first. Let's get to that. Verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. The house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And at this point, if you're listening to me, you ought to be asking the question, what is that day when Israel's enemies is going to be like stubble? And they're going to be consumed with fire. What is that day when God is going to supernaturally fight for Israel and put down all its enemies? Here is that day. Verse number 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. They shall look upon me. Who's talking here? whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Israel's going to realize 
The one we crucified was our Messiah. And grace and mercy is going to be poured upon that nation, that people, in that day. And they're going to be broken over that fact. And they're going to weep and wail as only a Jewish person knows how to do. I can see them with their sackcloth and ashes. Oh, oh, we repent. We rejected our Messiah. How could we have been so blind? And in that day, the greatest thing of all, Zechariah 13, 1, in that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and uncleanness. And what is that fountain? We sing about it. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. How do we pray for the peace of Jerusalem? I want to revolutionize your thinking on this. It doesn't mean that they're going to level Gaza. That's not what it means to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It doesn't mean that more of them die than more of the Israelites die. No, that's not what it means to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It doesn't mean that they become rich and wealthy and prosperous. No, that's not what it means to pray. For By the way, that's not what it means to pray for the peace of someone you care about who's troubled either. Remember, if you know Jesus, you'll know peace. But if there's no Jesus, there's no peace. That's what your loved ones need. That's what your friends and co-workers and neighbors need. It's a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it takes them being broken in body and spirit and mind in order for that to take place, then let God do His work. Amen. Pray for peace. Pray for peace. So how do we pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Romans 10, verse number 1. This is Paul speaking here. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. It's the Apostle Paul. What is the result of Paul's prayer? What is one day going to be the result of God's people praying for the peace of Jerusalem and Israel? Look at Romans 11 often said this, Trey's got some friends up from Bob Jones University. And I've often said that if you understand Romans 9 through 11, you'll understand the entire Bible. Okay? It's just, it's, it's, it's Israel, it's the Gentiles, it's, but that, that's like a high point of Scripture there. If you can understand that and get that correct. And, uh, but here it is, just reading it for what it says. Paul has said in chapter 10, verse 1, I'm praying for Israel to be saved. Chapter 11, verse 25 through 27, it says this, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. He's talking about the children of Israel here. He's not spiritualizing it at all. And so in verse 26, it naturally flows. And so all Israel shall be what, church? Saved. Saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. That means a hundred percent of the Jewish people are going to be saved. But that means as a nation, as a group of people, one day they're going to be miraculously converted. And what it takes to bring them to that point is going to be very hard. But it will be worth it when they receive their Messiah, receive forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. So for us, Praying for the peace of Jerusalem means praying that the Jewish people will embrace their Messiah, the 
the Lord Jesus Christ. Praying for your friend, your family member. I appreciate it when some folks pray for folks that need to be saved. But if you want your friends or your family to have peace, if you want to have peace, you need to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. This is how we pray for peace in people's lives. The same way we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we pray for that person who is troubled to turn from their sins and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Because here's that universal truth. K-N-O-W Jesus, K-N-O-W peace. N-O Jesus, N-O peace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that you've showed us through your word today. It's a hard thing to see anyone suffer. We know how much you have invested in your people Israel. And to see them having their babies with heads cut off being taken captive in the middle of the night. To see this breaks our hearts. To see our friends and family struggling, whatever it may be with addiction or family issues or some sort of other sin or financial woes or whatever it may be, it breaks our hearts. But we ought not lose focus of what we all need more than anything else. And that is the forgiveness of sins, the eternal life, the relationship with you that we only find in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray for Jerusalem's peace. We pray that revival might sweep that land and that many would be saved and converted in true repentance, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that friend that your spirit has brought to our mind, or that family member, we pray the same thing, that they might find the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, before it's eternally too late. Apply this, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.